expression and defend the liberties that make it possible. PEN America is the largest of the more than 100 centers worldwide that make up the PEN International Network, including our sister center in Nigeria. Excuse me. Excuse, I'm sorry, Nadine. Um, not, not, not my, do you confirm that this is just the session is just starting now? Yes, now you can start the session. Okay, because we already made a statement, so maybe we just start from scratch. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Ikechuku Ozoma. I'm the Africa Staff Attorney at Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights, and it's my pleasure to moderate this event. This event is part of the Humanical uh, Advocacy Days and focuses on addressing Nigeria's shrinking civic space through a proactive, holistic approach. I'll just give some framing remarks and then I'll pass on to a phenomenal panel that I can't wait to listen to. We are having this conversation a little under a year to Nigeria's 2023 general elections. Six days ago, the ruling party announced May 30th as the date for its primary elections. And on the tomorrow, the 27th of April, the main opposition party is scheduled to begin the vetting process for all, its, all of its presidential aspirants. While there are a few new names and faces, the majority of aspirants, especially at the presidential level, are same old, same old, as the saying goes. Another aspect of Nigeria's reality that follows the same, same old, same old paradigm is civic space. Some would argue that things may have even gotten worse in Nigeria concerning civic space. A snapshot may be helpful. The Civicus Monitor still rates Nigeria as repressed, similar to the last pre-election period. The Freedom in the World Report scores Nigeria as partly free. While the government has failed to transparently implement the recommendations of the panel of inquiry established to investigate the Lekki massacre of October 2020, the decision of the ECOWAS court in the Twitter ban case, which made the news last year, is pending and the, government, the government's action recently deactivating over 70 million telephone lines continues to be discussed. It's useful to add that, this, that security and economic challenges persist. A thin ray of hope anyway is the revived civic awareness and participation, especially in the Nigerian youth. Though stymied by systemic and structural dysfunction, there continues to be a genuine desire to contribute to change, call out dysfunction, and organize to consolidate on the power of the people. To me, this is the prerequisite for the necessary transformation that Nigeria requires and can only be catalyzed by a thriving civic space. I'm glad to be joined by an esteemed panel to discuss practical steps for addressing Nigeria's shrinking civic space, and I look forward to this conversation. We would love for the session to be interactive, and so we'll ask you to kindly drop comments through the chat function or leave questions through the Q&A function. We'll be checking on that and would love to um, get your thoughts. To start us off, we would have Nadine Farid Johnson. Nadine serves as the Penn America Washington Director. She's an attorney and advocate with a focus on democracy human rights and governance. She has a breadth of experience across the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. She has a long resume that I cannot attempt to go through at this point, but it's my pleasure to have you here, Nadine, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ikechukwu. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. PEN America is a nonprofit that stands at the intersection of literature and human rights to protect free expression in the US and worldwide. We champion the freedom to write and we work to unite writers and their allies to celebrate creative expression and defend the liberties that make it possible. PEN America is, one, is the largest of over 100 centers worldwide that make up the PEN International Network and that includes our sister center in Nigeria. 
A major part of our work involves advocating for writers and intellectuals around the world who face serious repercussions, including imprisonment, harassment, and violence for their work. We engage regularly on a range of countries and cases each year. As a free expression organization, we have been truly alarmed by the dangerous acceleration of Nigeria's treatment of this fundamental right, including by the closure of civic spaces and attacks against protesters, artists, and journalists. The government of Nigeria must preserve the rights of protesters and the press, and it must preserve the space for expression and communication, including online. In the words of Nigerian playwright and Nobel laureate Wale Sienka, the greatest, freedom to, the greatest threat to freedom is the absence of criticism because freedom of speech and the freedom of thought are essential features of a democracy and are necessary for sustained political stability and economic progress. We are witnessing a worrisome shrinking of the broad and vibrant civil, civil society space in Nigeria. In this 22, 2022 country report on Nigeria, Freedom House noted the harsh threat environment facing non-governmental organizations in particular stating that members of some organizations face intimidation and physical harm for speaking out against Boko Haram or encounter obstacles when investigating alleged human rights abuses committed by the military against Boko Haram suspects. Groups operating in the Niger Delta region face intimidation. Aid workers operating in the Northeast are impeded by restrictions imposed by civilian and military officials, as well as by the activities of armed groups. According to the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, humanitarian workers in Ad Adamawa, Borno, and Yobe states reported over 1,000 incidents where their work was impeded in just the first quarter of 2021, and one aid worker died during this period. Military and police have also been accused of rampant, indiscriminate use of force against Nigerian citizens. Amnesty International has reported that the Special Anti-Robbery Robbery Squad, SARS, was responsible for at least 82 cases of torture, ill treatment, and extrajudicial killings between 2017 and May 2020. SARS was dissolved in 2020, yet allegations of police abuse do persist. The courageous NSARS protests saw demonstrators killed and dozens more protesters and journalists injured by police and military forces. Despite these protests and notwithstanding the dissolution of SARS, safety and freedom of expression of individuals continue to be threatened. Legislative efforts have enabled the targeting of the media and others to be seen to be critical of the government and have painted dissent under a broad brush of endangerment to national security. These instances are but a few acts in a long and growing line to suppress free expression, association, indigent, and dissent in Nigeria. The country continues to face critical problems in securing civil liberties, media freedom, and government transparency, despite a constitutional protection for freedom of expression. For instance, the current government has used the Cyber Crimes Act to quell dissent since its election in 2015. We've, had, we've seen instances of journalists and poets detained. We have seen instances of individuals, college students who are arrested and detained for over, 180, over 180 days. And this act is not the only government power used to silent dissents. Government fines for hate speech and fake news are a minimum of 5 million naira, now $13,000. The National Broadcasting Commission fines against radio stations for promoting unverifiable information and views that can incite crime and public disorder. This after the airing of comments criticizing the government's handling of the Boko Haram crisis. In a positive development, ECOWAS just ordered the Federal Republic of Nigeria to amend its cybercrime law earlier this month in a case that highlights the digital security risks and challenges that journalists and dissidents face in the country. However, we need to really focus on the fact that these repressive actions are continuing and at every single step, the Nigerian government is working to make it more and more difficult for civil society to be able to flourish as it should. Nigerians have a right to address their grievances through free expression and through public demonstration. And journalists have a right to cover those protests and information without government reprisal, much less state-sponsored violence. More than two decades after the end of military rule, Nigeria risks losing the democratic gains that it has achieved. The government must recommit to defending fundamental rights and freedoms, which are essential to a strong and healthy democracy. Nigeria may very well be the world's most populous full electoral democracy by 2050. This is massive, massive importance and will have an incredible impact on the future of democracy, both in the continent and, and the broader globe. 
it is more imperative than ever that Nigeria's civil society is not only permitted to exist, but encouraged to thrive that civic participation is protected and that all citizens with a particular emphasis on the marginalized groups, women and young people are able to engage safely in civic discourse. Addressing the continually deteriorating situation in Nigeria requires political will and true commitment. As we know, the Biden administration has pledged to make human rights the center point of its foreign policy. We urge the US government to make human rights the centerpiece of US foreign relations with Nigeria and to attach human rights conditions to arms deals and military collaboration. We also urge the US government to support the release and review of stringent bail conditions for human rights activists and political dissidents in Nigeria. I'll stop here, but look forward to additional questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nadine, for that um, presentation highlighting clearly the challenges of to freedom of expression, freedom of association, the right to protest, the clamp down on dissent, the um, over militarization of protests and just the shrinking civic space in Nigeria that does militate against development, militate against, um, you know, building on the democratic gains that Nigeria has made and declare calls to the Nigerian government in, you know, it, it couldn't have been put in a better way to not only permit or allow civil society to succeed, but encourage them to try, but well, not just to allow them to exist, but to encourage them to try. Um, and for the US government to in their foreign policy with Nigeria actually um, highlight human rights as a key, uh, uh, as a center point to that foreign policy. Thank you so much for, for those comments. Um, to take us forward, would hear from Charles Quellum, who is a senior peace education and advocacy associate uh, um, at the inter uh, for at the international um, no, at the Minonet Central Committee at Washington, in here in Washington, DC. He regularly meets with congressional offices and administrative officials, including the State Department, USAID, and DOD to convey MCC's perspective to public policy. Charles also leads workshops, speaking engagements on US policy towards Africa and foreign assistance, including around humanitarian, um, food justice, food security, development assistance, and peace building. It's a, pleasure, it's a pleasure to have you here, Charles. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ike. Uh, so uh, I'll just go ahead and say that, um, that human rights abuses in all forms are a violence against the individual, family, community, and society. And uh, we do know that um, those those the harm that they experience is both bodily and psychologically so and i know that nadine actually pointed out the harms and professional harms that have been meted on uh, on media pr practitioners and then also civilians for example who went out to peacefully and non violently uh, non violently protest against the government as brutality. And so having said that, I would say that interventions as a whole, that is to say, um, uh, all, uh, all, all approaches uh, from, from all angles uh, in order to contain, in order to salvage, and in order to solve, to solve this situation, definitely would have to be holistic. And then that should also include trauma-informed approaches because whether we like it or not people have been hurt psychologically and so they need healing and recovery then having said that i would say that mental health and 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 for example have received less attention over the years and this we can see so uh so in the midst of police brutality for ex for example responses that we have received have been probably just legislations and then maybe uh, uh, for the Nigerian security to be uh, 
reformed and so on and so forth, and then issued the issue of development and well-being. But however, a, a psychosocial support is extremely important. And that is the reason why uh, uh, we know that uh, if the trauma of someone, I mean, if someone is experiencing trauma, for example, from police brutality and then from, from the oppression Nigerian government, for example, then what it means is that if that trauma, if that shock, all harm is not treated, then definitely it's going to be transferred to others. And that is the reason why we would have to break these cycles of violence. And so how do we break these cycles of violence? Uh, breaking the cycle of violence will entail uh, uh, the government of Nigeria and then also international partners like, like the United States government, for example, to assist, to assist Nigerians in, in receiving traditional uh, psychosocial support that are necessary. And so there are so many persons who are involved in, in such service delivery. And that is the reason why I would say that um, that solving the problem is like bringing build, building blocks together in order to build a, a house. If a block is missing, is a block. If a block is missing from the construction or from the making of a house, definitely there's going to be a collapse. And so I want to point out this evening that psychosocial and trauma healing inter individual or collective in this case is one of is one of the essential uh, 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 building blocks to solving the many problems of Nigeria and I have to say that if it is missing then what it means is that the rest interventions that have been implemented not be effective and that is the reason why uh, uh, I would recommend that you all listening this evening to us you you reach out to your policymakers and to your legislators, uh, be them senators or be them representatives, make them understand that it is important that the U.S. government establishes a psychosocial support and mental health account, which is going to be part of, which is going to be part of what what we call the S Forbes. That is um, the account from which. Uh, the State Department and then USAID, for example, use the money in order uh, um, to bring about development and health and health intervention. And so there is a need to designate a special account for psychosocial support so that the intervention on psychosocial support will be holistic and robust. And then also it will be good now that we are in um, um, in a time for budget season and appropriations. It would be good also to highlight before, before um, our, legisl our legislators the importance of increasing a robust humanitarian and development assistance as well in order to complement support funding as well. And then it would be good also for the US government to increase access to these funds by the grassroots and in Nigeria, for example, who are very, who, who are contextual and who traditional uh, um, and unconventional means and tools that they can put in place in order to address shock, trauma, and psychosocial harms that that our brothers and sisters have received uh, as a result of um, government's oppression upon them. And then also, let us let us here in the U.S to generate legislative tools, for example, that will discourage anti democratic space legislations, which Nadine mentioned, you know. So we, so we need a robust diplomatic effort from the US government onto the Nigerian government. And then I am sure that by the time we ask us here to introduce bills, be them, um, uh, be them resolutions, for example, that will discourage Nigerian politicians and the, and the Nigerian government as a whole from clamping down on innocent Nigerians who are peaceful. And then in that way, we will see that the Nigerian populace will work towards whole being and then also recovery as well. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Charles. Thank you. Thank you so much. And unpacking that holistic approach to addressing the, um, and, and I think it goes beyond just the shrinking civic space. That's just one manifestation of the, what I would usually refer to as the general malaise that um, we deal with in Nigeria. Um, you know, highlighting the importance of mental health and psychosocial support um, for the citizens, given the crises and um, the the uh, the unfortunate um, relationship that has existed between security forces and Nigerians in the context of civic space, be it you know in person in protests or online or even just in terms of. Um, intimidating human rights defenders, intimidating um, uh, uh, you know people who are critical to government, and you also make the point that you know trauma, if not dealt with properly, can be passed on, and and so to address trauma, it's important to go to the root source, root cause of it, and you know I would come back to that uh, because we we are talking about a country of over 200 million people. And, you know, one would, would question the possibility to scale psychosocial support to that large mass of people. Um, but maybe if the root cause is dealt with, then, you know, we, we, we have a, a lower um, number of, of people who, you know, would, would need this level of support. And then you know you end with the cost the U.S. government to do more, um, and for the Nigerian government in particular. I love the point you made around grassroots organizations, um, which is also one aspect of uh, the Nigerian reality that you know uh, um, it's that that has become the bane of 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 our development, the destruction of the grassroots government, the local government. And that also manifests in the, the, the um, denying grassroots organizations, faith-based organizations, civil society organizations, the voice to contribute to policy making. So that just you know causes uh, a distance between the people and the government. But thank you so much, Charles, for, for, for those comments. We have a few questions and I would encourage our participants. We have a lot of participants. I would encourage you to please um, you know, drop your questions or comments, whatsoever comments you have. We would love to reflect on those in the 15 or so minutes we have. But there's one question here from Nathan Hosler, um, and it's around the recent um this recent approval for uh, 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 the arms deal to Nigeria, the Nigerian government, I think it was $1 billion. Um, so, and, and so the question is, could you speak to the recent notification of an arms sale to Nigeria, both in relation to civic space, uh, the civic space conversation and the international ask for the EAD? Um, any of you can take the, the question? Yeah. So let me take it. Uh, sorry, I, I missed out that recommendation actually while I was presenting. That was actually my last recommendation. So, in as much as in as much as we have been asking the U.S. government to assist the Nigerian government and the Nigerian populace as a whole with thanks and humanitarian assistance as well, uh, we have been we have been asking the U.S. government, and then we will continue. And even now, I would ask those of you who are listening to us to inform your legislators. The U.S. government should 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 not should discontinue should discontinue this security that they are pumping to Nigeria uh, to the Nigerian government at the moment. This is because previously the the Nigerian military has actually malhandled the Nigerian populace using their weapons, which, which of course, they were given by the U.S. government or which they purchased from the weapons against Nigerians, innocent Nigerians. We saw what happened at NSAS. We saw what happened in the Southeast, for example. And, and then also, even, even in the Northeast, we know that at some point in time, in their claim 
in their claim of trying to counter Boko Haram, for example, they have ended up killing and wiping off a whole a, a whole community of innocent of innocent brothers and sisters. And so, because the Nigerian government and the Nigerian military are not transparent and accountable, and because they enjoy immunity, that is the reason why we are calling on we are calling on the U.S. to discontinue this 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 form of militarization, which which they are which they are now embarking on. Could you just imagine one billion dollars if the Nigerian government invests one billion dollars appropriately? Tell me, would it not go? Would it not go so far to res to to at least resolving the issue of hunger, for example, which which my brothers and sisters, my grand my 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 my, my grandparents are are experiencing currently now so that is the reason why we would say that if if the if the u.s government gives the nigerian government this these helicopters this this uh, uh this these choppers that the, this watch war helicopters for example we foresee a situation whereby the nigerian military will use it even on the day of elections because already there is this mindset that a section of the country is reacting and resisting to elections. Would you just imagine what would be the outcome? Just like NSAS, it would be worse than NSAS. So I think that the Nigerian, I think that the US government is actually doing a mistake by by giving Nigerian government a $1 billion worth of uh, uh, war chopper. And if I should follow up on that, on that quickly, um, if you don't mind, Kachaku, I. I fully agree with what Charles is saying, um, and I think the accountability point is particularly important. This also sends a really negative message to civil society. At the same time, we purport to be trying to uplift civil society in Nigeria. This message says essentially that if there is deemed to be a national security issue, a foreign policy issue, that somehow human rights can go by the wayside. And that cannot be the message that we're sending. It should be that we recognize that those foreign policy objectives, those national security objectives are not incompatible with human rights. There can and must be an, an intentional balancing of the issues. And I think that we lose our leverage if we, if we fail to exercise it. You know, this arms sale came at the, at the tail end of what had been a pause. Yet we don't really see that there has been many things that has changed so substantively that would warrant this, this, new, uh, this new deal. And I think, again, that it does send a dangerous message and we need to really be focused on how do we ensure that we are uplifting civil society, that we are ensuring their well-being and the well-being of, of Nigerian citizens, and that we do not have this, this idea of, of security um, from a national security perspective for the U.S. or from the security of, of Nigerians that is somehow seen to upend the obligations and responsibilities we have vis-a-vis -vis human rights. All right. Thank you, Nadine. And thanks, 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 Charles. Um, to your point, Nadine, um, one participant, Daniel Otide, had sent a comment, and his comment is that the Nigerian government finds it hard to see civil society as partners in progress because they serve as watchdogs and hold the government accountable. Um, that 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 accountability component is 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 missing, and it's it's. You know um, the the sense of the 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 structure of a democracy is lost. Is a it should be a government of the people. In which case, the elected officials should really listen to the people and toe the line of the people and you know congregate the 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 ideas and the intentions and the desires of the people. In this case, it seems to be the government of a few, and you know everyone must be compelled to follow and serve the interests of a few. Um, but of course, that's, that is not a democracy. Um, and there's also another question here, um, which just reflects on you know, a recent publication uh, on, the, on the fact that uh, suggesting that Nigeria is a failed state. Uh, you know, this also comes up after, before every election. There's an assessment of whether Nigeria is a failed state or not. And the question here from Tama Bahati is, 
Is Nigeria a failing state or just a, bad gov a badly governed country? And what is the role of regionalism and tribalism in Nigerians' current situation? Um, that, that is a packed question. And uh, I, I'll just throw it open for anyone to, you can just take a part of it um, however uh, you, you would love to. Uh, yeah, Charles, you could start again. Yeah. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, I actually contest the use of the term failed state. Moreover, because because that that term has been hijacked and institutionalized, and because there is and because there is a monopoly a monopoly of the framing of that of that term, and then at the same time the interpretation of that term. That is the reason why I kind of want to shy away a little bit uh, from that approach of seeing Nigeria as a failed state. But however, we would know that Nigeria has, has her own unique challenges. And those unique challenges tend to kind of interact, interact with the lack of capacity for good governance. And because it interacts with the lack of capacity for good, for good governance, and so the Nigerian government's uh, approach approach to to meeting the needs of nigerians reactionally and aggressive and because it is reactionally and aggressive that is the reason why we see the bounce back the bounce back but however having having mentioned this i would say that that nigeria nigeria as a state has not failed yet but rather but rather it seems it's it, it feels the cracks on the wall Yes, it fills the cracks on the wall. And the reason why it's filling those cracks on the wall is because of the form of politicization that we have in our country. And that politicization, for example, that has been that has been biased and and that don't exclude uh, exclude others from participating. The same the same politicization that led to the civil war. Before the before the 1970, so so Nigeria can only be a failed state, for example, when it goes back to the experience of the civil war. But we also that that would not that wouldn't occur. Uh, so I'll just leave at that to say that regi uh, regionalism, for example, at, and tribalism are those intrinsic characteristics of Nigeria because Nigeria is multi-ethnic. It is multi-ethnic. So we have over 400, 400 um, languages in Nigeria, and then even, even ethnic groups. So diversity should be strength if if it is well harnessed. And so that's the reason why right. that's the reason why the Nigerian government should sit up to become inclusive and participatory instead of exclusive and intimidatory. Right. And then just to to come to you, Nadine, there are no perfect democracies anywhere, right? Yeah, or we, we have challenges yeah. across the world. Um, uh, and so what do you think is the, the difference between, you know, uh, uh, the democracy that is developing positively and one that is re like retrogressing? And what are the lessons that can be pulled, you know, just from ar around the globe that are applicable to Nigeria at this point? Uh, that, that's a that's a great question and, and your your premise is, is obviously correct there are no perfect democracies we we it's incumbent upon the citizens and residents of democratic states to hold their governments accountable and i think that one of the things we owe ourselves is is, is a mirror in addition to looking externally and the United States in particular has a role to play to defend against authoritarianism, both in its own borders and externally. For this case of Nigeria, we can do that by sustaining and strengthening the practice of, of implementing sanctions um, against Nigerian officials who are guilty of electoral practices, malpractices and abuses of office. Lessons we can take from elsewhere include those stringent adherence to global laws and norms, and ensuring that we are tending to our own backyard, if you will, by also looking ahead to be supportive of, of those elsewhere. I, I don't 
I, like, like Charles, I also reject the, the, the phrase of failed state. As I mentioned, we are less than 30 years away from Nigeria being the largest electoral democracy in the world. There are enormous implications for, for that fact. And it is incumbent upon other democracies, including the United States, to ensure the well-being of Nigeria's government for the well-being of its people as well. All right. Thank you so much, Nadine. And just a clarification, uh, um, Tama Bahati's question was, was Nigeria a failing state, not a failed state? Just just that clarification. But Good I think all, yes. the, all the, yes. all, all Words the matter, answers, yes. yeah, definitely. But, you know, all these answers are applicable. And um, thank you so much for, for, for these. And we'll, we'll, we'll start to wrap up now. In terms of just... Um, you know, looking inwardly also, like in terms in, within Africa, it's Nigeria being the most populous country in Africa, um, you know, sometimes being the leading economy in Africa and all the structures we have in Africa, you know, the African Union and the like, how would you assess the importance of um, Nigeria's um, democratic status? to the rest of Africa? And what role do you think the these you know, intergovernmental organizations in Africa can play to um, serve as a, a, a peer review mechanism, for want of a better description, for each other in terms of growing, um, positively leaning democratic practices? Charles, you want to go ahead? Oh no, okay. okay, it's fine, Nadine, you can say yeah. <laughs> either, either one. Um, I mean, I, th I think we can, we can both speak to this. I, I don't think you can overestimate the importance of having a solid, stable, democratic Nigeria. It is truly the, the driving force be, behind most of, of, of the continent's well-being. And as we've seen, there are, there are some incredibly fragile governments and, and we've seen some pretty disturbing trends uh, across the continent right now in the, in the past several months in particular. And Nigeria, I think that having a, again, a stable Nigeria, a democratic Nigeria is, is critically important. <laughs> and as it actually comes to Daniel's point earlier about the Nigerian government finding it hard to see the civic space as being partners because it's difficult to hear criticism. And we've seen that time and again when there are very difficult and sometimes intractable issues that are that the government is facing. Um, but part of that partnership is to, again, allow that for allow for accountability, allow for their criticism and look to civil society to to serve as a partner, because there is a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of expertise, a wealth of divergent and differing and um, diverse viewpoints to which we should be listening. And I want to come back to Charles's point. I would love to actually hear Charles' um, thoughts about this because so much of this comes from people's lived experiences. And if they have mm -hmm. endured trauma and other um, negative experiences at the hands of their own government, that actually can be a true, offer true learning for, for government as well as for, for the members of society. I'd love to hear Charles' thoughts. Yeah, yeah, you are right. There would be a source of learning to the government and then also to at large, including themselves. But however, unfortunately, uh, the Nigerian government doesn't seem to be interested in learning in learning from the lessons of the past. That's one thing. Uh, then again, uh, uh, just to say that Nigeria act actually has a glorious image in the region. So economically and security-wise, Nigeria has actually enjoyed the status of a giant in the sense that it has always been emulated by other countries from, from the region, in, in fact. And so, and so I see that if Nigeria, for example, sits up, I mean, if the government of Nigeria or, or if Nigerian governance sits up, definitely it's going to be not only spectacular, but it's going to be an an exemplary um, of, um, for for other governments in Africa to actually emulate, especially even 
West Africa. I'll just leave it at that. Right. Thank you so much, Charles. And um, I wish we had more time to just dig further into these these issues. But one thing is clear: there's there's a hope, there's there's a promise that Nigeria carries, and um, maybe with the growing um, uh, you know awareness and quest for participation, the growing um, restiveness actually in, in Nigerians to reject what has become the status quo and, you know, sometimes paying the ultimate price to make their voices heard. Um, it's, it's, it's my hope, and I, I know that of everyone here, that, you know, we would see a Nigeria that respects civic space, that allows civic space to thrive, that supports human rights, that protects its citizens and creates uh, an atmosphere for development, both individually and you know, uh, and, and you know, uh, um, collectively for all Nigerians and all uh, and all in all um, uh, extractions. And um, just because uh, Ntama Bhati's comments in the comment section has have been very, very. Uh, 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 amazing. I, I would like to end with one of his comments, which is a quote, according to him, from Thomas Aquinas, which says that we must be grateful to people who hold a different opinion from us, even if they are in error, because they help us to understand the right reason of things. I hope that this is a disposition that the Nigerian government takes up and even Nigerians, you know, by themselves, take up going into the elections so that the outcome is something better than what we, what I, I, def, I, I described as same old, same old in the opening. Um, and on that note, I'd like to thank you, Nadine. Thank you, Charles. I'd also like to thank Helen, um, Helen Philemon, her guy who is in the audience and was supposed to be up here, but because of some um, issues, couldn't join. Thank you so much, Helen. You're up at 2 a.m. in Nigeria. Um, thank you so much for the sacrifice. And i also like to thank the about 35 people who joined this conversation. Thank you so much for doing this. And um, we, 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 we live hopeful and we live expecting that things will turn around for the better. Thank you and have a good evening. Bye, everyone.